Hello everyone, welcome to Zero Labs. Today is Sunday, January 22nd, 2017. I'm Mark Brash, your host, and the induction furnace is done. So why did I build an induction furnace or induction heater or induction coil, whatever you want to call it, why did I build it? I built this to be a tool. This is just the first step in a rather long journey that I predict. Um, I built this to be a tool to melt metals, to create alloys, to conduct the real experiment that all of this is a precursor to. And that real experiment is to delve into non-Julian magnetostriction and the, the properties of the uh, soft iron gallium alloy that was written about in Natural News. Um, and uh, I, I have the, the uh, peer-reviewed white paper. I've read it through several times. Um, it's going to be interesting. There's still a long way to go yet a long way to go. Um, I did get some financial support the last time that I asked for some help with getting some stuff together and fortunately it was enough to get as far as I have gotten so far. Um, this Variac right here <laughs> was given to me by Spart uh, Smart Scarecrow. It's a 20 amp AC Variac. That came in very handy for this project. Uh, with your help, I was able to buy power MOSFETs. I was able to buy another bank of capacitors to rebuild the tank circuit for the induction heater. Um, if you'd like to know how to build one of these yourself, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of little nuances that you need to pay very careful attention to um, when building the project. Most notably, it is in your selection of components right down to the material that is that the toroidal transformers or toroidal transformers are made of okay there are um, two toroidal transformers in this project there were three but I burned one of them up I didn't really need it for this particular version that's a good thing uh, but the uh, the first toroidal transformer is about an inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter and it is used to isolate the drive current or the drive voltage to the gates of the four MOSFETs in the H-bridge uh, driver circuit that I'm using for this induction heater. The second core is for this induction coil. Uh, it is the impedance matching transformer. It is what the H-bridge drives its signal into and the, that that AC voltage, that high frequency AC voltage, is coupled to the tank circuit through the work coil by this toroidal transformer. Uh, the, the materials that these are made of are extremely critical. I tried other things that I had laying around, didn't work, had to buy, had to buy the right materials to get the job done. I will be posting at altenergy.org very shortly. It's not there now, but I will be posting very shortly all of the details that went into the build of this project, okay? From the component specifications to how I selected the capacitors um, to how I wound the coil, all those little details, um, very, very important. But probably the single most critical component that you need to shop for is the capacitors that you use for the tank circuit. The first group of capacitors that I bought were one microfarad, 1.2 kV, Cornell, Cornell Dublier uh, 941 capacitors, model 941 capacitors from Mauser Electronics. They had a, a, uh, an equivalent series resistance of only 5 milliohms each. They, they were rated at 19 amps each. 
Um, but when the circuit was in operation, one of, the, one of the parameters that I exceeded was the voltage at the specified frequency that I'm running. And when I exceeded that rating, this is what happened to the capacitors. They melted. And they changed characteristics, so these are no longer usable. I'll be doing post-mortem autopsies on these just, to, just for grins and giggles to see what, what it actually looks like inside. But uh, they didn't short circuit. That was a good thing. But uh, they did change properties, and they're unusable now. I ended up buying 50 of the Kemet R76 variety uh, capacitors. I'm using 48 of the 50 in my tank circuit. They are all in parallel. And uh, the whole bank of capacitors is good for approximately um, four to 500 amps continuous, uh, continuous current. And uh, it is rated for 250 volts AC uh, at 1,275 watts, which is the maximum amount of power that I've gotten to so far with the induction heater. I'm put, it's about 175 volts RMS across this capacitor bank. So they do get a little warm. I did have to add a fan to keep them, to keep them warm if I run them, or to keep them cool if I run them for any length of time. Um, so with that, let's just get into a brief description of some of the major components that went into building this, and then we'll have some fun. So in this picture here, you have a general overhead view of the entire uh, of the entire setup. In the top left, you see the massive Variac transformer that was given to be my smart scarecrow. To the right of that is a piece of plywood onto which I've mounted the, uh, the phase lock loop drive control circuit. Below that is the driver circuit with the fan mounted directly to the heat sink and the placement of those two components next to one another. The fan is actually cooling both heat sinks at the same time. Uh, at the top left corner of the plywood board is a 24 volt AC transformer. Actually, it's uh, a 16 volt AC transformer that uh, produces approximately 25 volts unfiltered DC for the 15 volt regulator on the PLL board. And in the extreme upper left hand corner is a 150 amp shunt that produces 100 millivolts at 150 amps. So for every millivolt measured across that shunt, I, I see 1.5 amps in the circuit. Uh, on the board, I just have a couple of uh, multimeters. I have a digital multimeter for my monitoring my current, and I have an analog multimeter for monitoring my voltage. I usually leave it on the 300 volt scale. And at the extreme right is a outlet box with a power switch that is my master control switch that turns on everything. So I have my Variac plugged into it, I have my, uh, my water circulation pump, I have my PLL circuit, and I have the AC cord to the cooling fan for my capacitor bank. Lastly is the tank circuit itself. This is obviously one of the most critical parts of the whole setup, and uh, like I said, the capacitors are extremely, extremely critical when you select your capacitors. Here are a few pictures of the PLL circuit board as they were going together, both the uh, top view and the bottom view, as well as the, uh, the drawings that I made to, to work by. And as I said, these will be posted at altenergy.org for you to, uh, to follow if you wish to build one of these yourselves. Uh, here are some pictures of the driver circuit showing the MOSFETs and how they are cross-wired uh, with the supply lines and uh, the uh, the circuit board that goes on top of that, with the uh, with the little um, toroid transformer that drives the gates. Here's a picture of the ferrite toroid that I purchased off of eBay for the impedance matching transformer. Here's a few shots of the latest bank of capacitors that I purchased in the uh, assembly process. Here I've got them all lined up on the bench next to one another. With the, with the leads twisted together. It's already soldered to one side of that copper bus and the other leads are just sticking up. And then in this photo, you see the copper bus on, on top with all of the leads folded down and, and soldered to that. Very tricky to solder these. I had to, I had to make some heat shields 
and I had to solder it with a with a uh, propane torch. So keeping the heat off of the capacitors and, and not burning and singeing the capacitors was quite the, quite the job. In fact, you'll see I did singe a few of these capacitors, but fortunately I did not actually damage the internals of the capacitor. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very tricky. What I really want for this assembly that I can't possibly afford, uh, without your help of course, uh, is one of these. This is a Salem c 500 T, 10 microfarad capacitor. Uh, they are approximately $350 delivered. So including the shipping and handling, you're looking at about $350 for just one of these. On the plus side, all you need is just one. So uh, yeah, I would really like to have one of these for this because that would allow me to to run continuous duty rather than uh, messing around with little capacitors like you see here and a cooling fan to keep them all cool because they get too warm as, as I'm trying to operate the, uh, the induction furnace. And without further ado, let's have some fun. All right, so next we're gonna melt this, this steel bushing. You can see I have it suspended inside the work coil using a couple of uh, aluminum oxide insulators for TO3 style transistors. They do with, withstand the heat of the molten metal, so uh, obviously that is the material of choice. And uh, here we go. And we got a lock. We've got uh, smoke. Obviously, there was some grease on it. <laughs> Not anymore. And we got it cooking. And we got it sparking. It's actually glowing purple. I'm seeing I the air ionizing. Wow, that is cool. That is very cool. I'm going to do another one of these close up. And it looks like it's starting to melt. I'm going to turn up the juice a little bit here. We're not at we're not at 15 amps yet. Oh yeah, look at that. Now it's puddling. and sparking and there it goes yeah I definitely have to do a close-up on this We're at 95 volts and 15 amps. And it looks like that's about all I'm going to get. The uh, material has, uh, has become oxygenated. So it's, uh, its resistance is very high right now. It didn't actually, it didn't actually puddle. If this was in argon, this probably would have uh, just went bloop, but because we're in the presence of oxygen, um, yeah. Now I've got a now I've got a uh, a clump of of crystalline metal, highly oxygenated. 
So here we go with uh, a, uh, a hex nut. Hundred volts, nine amp. Hundred volts, uh, fourteen point five amps. This is not time lapse, obviously. There's fifteen amps at hundred volts. So we got fifteen hundred watts going in. And that's almost as bright as a light bulb right now. Now it's starting to drip. And puddle. And spark. Isn't that pretty? Again, I have to break the insulators to get this out of here because, of course, it's melted to the insulator. And that, boys and girls, is how easy it is to melt metal with induction heating. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It really is a lot of fun. Uh, but as I said, it is, this is just now the tool that I need to work on the real experiment that I want to that I want to do. Uh, in order to do the real experiment that I want to do, I'm going to have to build a bread box type of uh, enclosure with uh, work gloves and seal a sealed cabinet enclosure that I can flood with argon gas to uh, to create the the iron alloy so that it doesn't get crystallized like these nuts that you see in this picture here uh, do. You can literally just crunch these with a pair of pliers now because they've been exposed to oxygen while they were in the molten state. And we can't have that. So I'll be, I'll be building an enclosure that the entire in, uh, tank circuit will go inside. The only, the only thing entering and exiting the enclosure will be the electrical terminals for the, uh, for the wiring course they will be sealed terminals and pipe fittings for the coolant to uh, keep the coil cool as uh, as it's doing its job heating the heating the alloy and uh, being poured into the ingots and and cooled at the control rate that I need all yada 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 um, so I hope you'll stick with us and continue to watch the experiment please share it with all your friends and family uh, and as always Please rate, share, comment, and subscribe to my videos, and peace everyone. Woo, that's hot.